I just want to say to you a very, very warm welcome on this uh, week, a very special week. Um, it's our National Volunteering Week, um, as we all know, a fabulous week to acknowledge and celebrate um, volunteers. So we're absolutely thrilled to see you all um, here in our Zoom chat. We're also recording for our YouTube channel, which is brilliant. We'll get this out to everybody um, so that they can um, watch us on YouTube as well. Um, so it's absolutely brilliant to, I suppose, have this opportunity to welcome you on behalf of studentvolunteer.ie presents. And today's session is focusing in on a very fascinating topic, um, looking at volunteering um, throughout the life course. Um, so we've got some lovely speakers for you who are going to be sharing the impact of youth volunteering, looking at, I suppose, various life stages in terms of adult volunteering. And then we have a, a researcher who's going to share with us the experience of older people and what's been really highlighted through research in terms of their volunteering experiences. So you're super welcome to um, this showcase, this panel. And yeah, I think we'll have a rich debate as well. Um, so to kickstart us, um, we're thrilled to, with the magic that is um, Zoom and uh, colleagues all over the world being able to connect in, we're popping up to, away here from County Mayo, up to County Dublin. And Teresa at UCD in Community um, had a very special conversation with Derek. So um, she's on the line there. We're going to pop over to Teresa. Happy volunteering, Teresa. And we're popping over to Teresa. <laughs> Here we go. And I think Teresa might be on mute there. So we'll just hang on a second and get Teresa going again. <laughs> Yeah, my lovely Formock is working with me here. Great, thanks. Derek has introduced young people to volunteering, sowing the seed for volunteerism and creating active citizens and future community leaders. Derek, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Teresa. It's a pleasure, as always, to talk to you. So Derek, I know we could talk all day about the topic of creating lifelong volunteers, but unfortunately we are a bit pressed for time today. So we'll jump straight in. And first of all, you might share with us your thoughts on the importance of introducing volunteering to young people at an early age and how this helps them hopefully go on to become uh, lifelong volunteers. Well, Teresa, as you mentioned in your intro, um, sowing the seeds of service. And I think that's especially what it's about at kind of an early starting in the process. So sixth class for me, is, is a great age. Now, I would say lots of young people do lots of good things before that. They mightn't say it's volunteering, but they're helping at home, or they might be helping as part of a club or a group. But in particular, the kind of, with our program, we have a formalized situation that happens at that 11, 12 age, that very important age. And if you kind of get them looking and thinking about others, how can I be of service? How can I help? What's the challenge? And amazingly, even at an early age, they get excited. They get the buzz, but it's an alternative buzz. It's a buzz for good, a buzz for giving back. So I say that's a perfect start. Six class, 11 to 12, and just ignite the fire of volunteering. That it's, you know, it's exciting. It can be challenging. And I think if it's, if it's lit early, then hopefully those embers go on to be flames and those flames go on to citizenship. Brilliant. Um, and Derek, I suppose, thinking about, I suppose, the young people getting involved in volunteering, would you have any tips for community organizations that are trying to, I suppose, get young people interested in volunteering, especially during COVID? Yeah, well, there's two elements to that. One, obviously, people volunteering under 18, it's different. 
because you have the child protection elements, you have the consent issues, so absolutely have all your child protection, have all your paperwork, have all your consent elements all in place. So full strong rigor, creating a safe atmosphere, step number one. Again, also, I think, I think quite often some people are thinking about volunteerism. Um, they're saying, okay, how can we get the people to be talking about it? But action is key, and young people are attracted to action. So if there's something you need a helping hand with, if there's something that needs doing, quite often the bringing together through the power of action can be a great call. So good call to action is very, very positive. And as you said, in these unusual pandemic times, the virtual volunteer has certainly got a place. I mean, we worked on a particular project where we used lots of different young people to create videos for nursing homes. And they did poems, they did quizzes, they did songs and dances, they even had their dogs in it. But there was real volunteerism in that because they were recording these pieces, then going onto laptops, going into people who were in isolation in nursing homes, providing smiles and support. So the, the virtual volunteer is very real, <laughs> if that's not a, a contradiction in terms. But again, blended is, is key too. So maybe in person where suitable and where possible, but virtual can certainly make a difference. So true, Derek. And I think the world of virtual volunteering has opened it up for so many new people who haven't experienced volunteering before. Um, and I suppose one thing that we're looking at is how, I suppose, the education sector, what role that plays in encouraging volunteering. So I know you work in partnership with a lot of schools. Um, what role do you think that, um, I suppose, primary, secondary and third level, um, what role does it play in making sure that volunteering is a key part of our society? Well, our program is entitled From the Classroom to the Community. And that's why I think it's absolutely vital to have that partnership. And in schools now, with the diversity of programs that they're delivering and the diversity of the educational style, it really can work. As you know, well-being is, is very much to the fore in the academic and education situation. And well, volunteerism is one of the key factors in increasing and improving your own well-being. I think a survey said that volunteers live longer. Now, quite often when you're 13, 14, 15, you're not always thinking of living longer, but longer, stronger, and happier. So it's at the heart of well-being. So it can be very much incorporated in the lessons that people are doing, but a key factor then is from the classroom to the community. And that allows us to work with the schools, but then take it outside. Now, in this particular situation, again, it often can be a virtual community, or it can be a social distance and safe community, but those things can still happen. Um, in fact, one of the challenges that was put to many schools is that quite often over the years, they've done a lot of intergenerational work, a lot of work with the elderly communities, having the elderly community into their, nurse, into their schools, them going into the nursing homes. But obviously the current situation makes that a challenge. So let's not give up on that because we can have the Zoom, we can have the virtual, and we can have, I mentioned earlier about messages going to nursing homes. That also allowed us to evolve a situation where they asked for artwork for the bedroom. So the students in their art classes, another great example of using a current class in school, so they're still following their own academic rigor, but yet their artwork projects are going to do good. They're going to connect, they're going to give back to the community. So from the classroom to the community is a great way to take volunteerism academically, but out into the real world. Brilliant, that's what we like to hear. Um, and I suppose, Derek, um, another interesting um, idea around lifelong volunteers. I suppose we, we say volunteers can start at any age, um, but what, I suppose, um, what would you encourage people out here who are listening to volunteering um, or to this talk today about volunteering? What would you encourage them to do to get involved in volunteering? Absolutely, well, I think every age and stage, it's important to have an element of your life that's involved in service, in giving back. And I think, again, it, in a weird way, it can be selfish because I've always found I get much more out. It sounds like an old cliche, yeah. but I get much more out of it than I actually give. New friends, new situations, my own talents discovered. So quite often, a good way in is that maybe you've got a talent or maybe you like to do something and you'd like to share that. And you think, well, how am I going to do that? So at a very early age and stage, it could be baking, it could be singing, dancing, but again, using that to give back. So I would say looking at some of your local clubs, start local, act local, think global. 
we used to always say, because there are opportunities out there. Of course, www.localize.ie, if you want to have, have a look at some of our programs. And um, I know this term in particular, we're launching the National Youth Volunteer, the, the National Virtual Youth Volunteer Program. So we're going to be able to hopefully, I say this hopefully, allow any young person anywhere in the country who wants to log on and give back. That's the target. So we really would encourage you at any age and stage, obviously, as I say, always with all the consent and all the child protection and the rigor in place, you know, it's uh, really never too early to give back or you're never too old. On the other scale of things, we have adult volunteers. In fact, we have a wonderful 84 year old adult volunteer and she works with our young people and works with our groups. So we're never too young, never too old to enjoy the power of volunteering. Brilliant. So you're really going across the life cycle of the volunteer there, Derek. Um, so I think we've actually run out of time. Um, and I know we could talk about this for another uh, two hours. Um, but I'd just like to thank you, Derek, for taking time out of your very busy schedule um, to join us here today. Um, it was a really interesting discussion and I'm sure will be of great interest to lots of people listening today. Um, I'll now pass you back to Lorraine, who will be continuing the discussion with some wonderful student volunteers. That's brilliant. Thanks, Teresa, and um, great chat with Derek. And we'll post up um, all the contact details if people would like to get in touch with Derek's organization as well, which I think would be nice. Um, brilliant. So that was a little flavor around youth volunteering, a little touch on, I suppose, how people um, connect in with organizations throughout their life. Um, up next, we've had the chance to chat to wonderful student Catherine well she's actually an alumni she's graduated and she's an active volunteer as an adult in her life um, with um, Childline in particular so yeah let's let's have our little chat with Catherine and um, say hi So hello, Catherine. Lovely to see you. Um, thank you for joining us. Happy National Volunteering Week. Um, you have been a very active volunteer as a student. Now you're an alumni, a graduate. You've been um, an alumni for quite a few years now. So you're in the real world, as they say. Tell us about what it's like to be a volunteer now. Um, so I've been volunteering with Chiline in Galway since 2017, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I think volunteering is a great way to get to know new people and there's a great sense of community in the unit. Um, I think you have a common interest with everyone you're volunteering with so you normally just you just get on straight away. Um, I think it's a great way to improve your skills so like with Chiland we do about three months of training first and so it's really helped my communication skills and um, which has also helped be in the world of work as well. Brilliant and do you think that maybe you were influenced when you were younger around volunteering and that's kind of why you've tapped in now as well that you're um, also working and and volunteering keeping both going? Um, yes I think like I had heard so much about the benefits of volunteering um, from a young age so I knew that it was something I always wanted to do so um, when I started working after I graduated, I knew that it was something I really wanted to incorporate in my weekly routine. And I knew that it would benefit my life in so many ways and also like uh, provide me with a meaningful experience, so. Brilliant. And so Catherine, if you were to kind of look forward, you know, in your adult life, <laughs> uh, do you think that something like volunteering will always feature and in what ways maybe do you think it might? Um, I think I've enjoyed my experience with Childline and Galway so much that I'd love, I'd really hope that I would be volunteering there um, in the future um, because it, is, it becomes such a part of your weekly routine to go in and to meet the fellow volunteers, you know, have a cup of tea and also um, we help each other a lot, like um, we support each other if someone has had a difficult interaction. Mm. Um, we can reassure each other after the call or the chat and we also help each other maybe if you're in the middle of a chat five 
advice to each other and what is the best thing to say. So I think um, it's really nice knowing that someone always has your back and that someone is always there to help you. You're never on your own. That's brilliant. You've kind of really given us a flavour of how you can build up a community around yourself as a volunteer as well. Catherine, thank you so much for your time. And you. yeah, enjoy the whole week of festivities for Volunteer Week. Thanks, Doreen. Bye now. Okay. That's brilliant. Thanks, Catherine, again. Um, yeah, a little bit of a sense there of how you can work volunteering into the weekly routine. I like that idea. It's part of your lifestyle, right? Um, brilliant. Um, our next um, wonderful contributor, Shepherd, is a current student in Dublin, in DCU. And uh, it's great to be able to chat to Shepherd. So yeah, let's, let's hear what volunteering um, sounds like from Shepherd's world. Hi Shepherd, thank you so much for joining us today on this very special week, National Volunteering Week. You are an outstanding volunteer and um, we're really grateful to be able to hear from you a little bit of a flavour of what it's like to be a volunteer and kind of your ideas as well as a volunteer. So my first question for you is about all the action that you've been doing on campus around being a class representative. I know it's a very active volunteer role and would love to hear your experiences of being a class rep and especially at the current time being a class rep, it's, it's a hugely important role. So share. Yeah. Hi Lorraine, thanks very much. I really appreciate you having me here. And um, well, to be honest with you, being a class rep, it's uh, actually a very interesting role because um, uh, in a way, representing students' views and liaising with individual students and academic staff, uh, you know what it is like sometimes. It's not always like people agree. Sometimes students will have their own issues. Sometimes they might not be relevant to the authorities. But then the thing is like, it's quite very interesting because uh, when I was doing it myself, like I look at the, the past year, uh, it was, well, I'm lucky in a way that every issue that I was involved in, everything was like resolved amicably. Both parties were happy. You find that when I went to the authorities, the authorities, they really understood what was going on with the students and they did their best to make sure that the students were happy. And even like when I went back to the students to give them like what the authorities would have said about their issues, the students were happy as well. So everything went very well in that way. So like, I, I, I feel like privileged to have had that opportunity of being like a middleman between like the students and the authorities. Wow, it sounds like you were a really strong liaison there and you had to do a lot of communication. <laughs> so well done on your volunteering with them. And also this year you were extremely active with um, a nonprofit organization, STAND, who run that fantastic Global Issues seminar course to really, I suppose, empower students around understanding interdependencies in the globe and unequal societies. Do you want to share a little bit about being a volunteer with STAND? Yes. You see, with STAND, um, the first thing is like when I received the email about um, STAND, when they were coming like um, to do a course at school, I actually looked, I didn't know anything about them. Then I looked at uh, what exactly they stand for and what it was about. So, in my case, I was actually like um, the big, biggest attraction to me was learning about the world's biggest problems and how I can help also in uh, dealing with some of the issues in the world. Because there's a lot of things that are happening in the world that needs uh, everybody's attention. Because the world, like if we look right now, it seems the world is so overshadowed by politics which is not easy like for global citizens to be aware of the world's real problems and how they can help like in dealing with those problems. Say for example, like now we look at like uh, the use of plastics. Mm. It's one of the big issues. So like 
when I did that uh, course with um, Stand, we actually learned about that. But then at the same time, it takes empathy. Because some of the things, like without empathy, it will be very difficult. I suppose like it starts with uh, having the ability to understand and share the feelings of one another. Mm. So I, I learned to give myself time for other people. So like, for example, the example that I gave you about uh, using the use of plastics, these days when I go into uh, a supermarket or every time I go shopping, I always uh, take my backpack with me. So when I go to a shop and they offer me a plastic bag, I always refuse. I always tell them like, look, um, I will use my bag instead of like taking the plastic. So it's one of the things like I feel that I'm taking part in uh, say not using plastic because the thing is like if you look at uh, what's happening like say in our seas and everything and if you look at those people that are volunteering and clearing up the seas and uh, like it's very bad to be honest mm. so, yeah it's very bad so I try by all means to play my part in doing like the little that I can and the other thing also that I learned uh, was like I'm in a direct provision myself. Mm -hmm. So there are people here in the direct provision, like people come from all walks of life. Some of them, they're coming from non-English speaking countries. They didn't have like the privilege, like say, for example, other people had like in learning English. Then all, all of a sudden they find themselves like here in Ireland, which is an English speaking country. So like, then you'd find that those people it doesn't really mean that they're not like educated or they don't have the, some education in them. But the thing is like, it's just the language barriers. So here I have uh, actually learned uh, to give myself time for others. Like I have friends here, but uh, non-speaking, that uh, non-English speaking. So I teach them. And some of them, like I'm actually happy because I was talking to one of the guys, like him now, his, his English is good. But uh, because I got a scholarship, a sanctuary scholarship, uh, which is the reason why I'm a student at the DCU. Mm -hmm. So there's a few people ever since I got, like I was the first one to go to scholarship in this uh, hostel where I am. So a lot of people like were asking me, they didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people were asking me uh, what it is like and how it is like. So many people like would really want to go to school. So I told them like how it works and everything. But then when I applied four years ago, I, uh, it was actually like myself, I remember, it was the very last week of those applications. And I actually didn't know, I just like completed my QQI uh, level five in English college. So I really wanted like to continue with my education. Then all of a sudden, like I found that scholarship, which was very good and thankfully, like I was offered a place and here I am today. So like there are people that come to me asking me and so far I've managed to help this another one. Uh, she's, I think she's doing a master's. I helped her last year, uh, I think two years ago, she got a place in the DCU. There's another girl, well, she's not in the DCU, but she also got the scholarship in, um, well, another a different university. Then a few weeks ago, uh, well, if last month, I think I helped another girl. She was applying uh, for this scholarship. She got it. She will be going to uh, Blackrock College. Then there's one guy that I've just been talking to a few minutes ago because they rang him, I think, from DCU uh, regarding the scholarship uh, about an hour ago. So he came to me to tell me that, oh, listen, I got a call from the DCU. And uh, they were asking me about my application and things like that. So it means that maybe they are processing. So I feel very happy to be helping these people. Like these are some of the things that I learned like uh, in that course. Great. I think, Shepard, what you've mentioned there is really kind of the appetite and energy that volunteers have. And you've really, I suppose, tapped into how um, volunteers can be motivated to be part of um, the solutions for global issues. Um, yes. So really inspiring. You've also tapped into informal volunteering, and I think we're seeing a lot of that now in terms of how can we, within our own communities, um, make those 
um, links and connections that support people in our communities. So it's um, that informal volunteering, if you like. So it's the connecting with individuals that you mentioned and supporting them with their issues. Um, Shepard, thank you so much for your time today. And it's wonderful to be able to get a snapshot into the life of a, of a volunteer and your experiences with both formal and informal volunteering on campus and with um, global issues. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lorraine. I really appreciate the time with you. Hopefully everything went well. And thanks very much, Komak, for, for being our engineer. <laughs> thanks again. Yes, big thank you to Cormac. And I'm loving all the applause as well um, for Shepherd. Um, brilliant to have your contribution, particularly around informal volunteering as a student, as an adult, um, really starting to come to the fore more so than ever. Um, our final contribution um, on our showcase is um, from Professor Kieran Walsh. Hello, Kieran. Uh, lovely to see you. Uh, we're going to unmute you now and I'm going to welcome you as Professor of Aging and Public Policy at the Institute for Life Course and Society at NYU Galway. Maybe a little insight to the um, older members of the community and I suppose what's their experience around volunteering okay, to zoom in on their life. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much Lorraine and thank you for, uh, for organising this and for giving me an opportunity chat to you as well. Uh, so as Lorraine said, I'm the uh, director of the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology, which is a research centre which focuses on ageing and public policy, but I am a part of the broader Institute for Life Course and Society. And there have been various, uh, I suppose, various activities and centres within the Institute that have really focused on volunteering right across the life course, whether that's children and youth, whether it's people with disabilities, or even people with uh, uh, dementia. But in my case, what I want to really focus on is just to have a few comments about volunteering in later stages of the life course and why that is essentially so important. I suppose from the outset, it's really important to recognize the importance of this topic in the context of COVID-19. So we had some of our contributors already talking about the challenges and uh, the, the real benefits of, of volunteering during COVID-19. I suppose from our side of things, um, it's really important to acknowledge this because we're only beginning now to understand the sort of contributions that older people have been making during the pandemic. It's only beginning, beginning to emerge anecdotally. And those contributions have been both formal in terms of local and community responses, and a lot of times informal as well. But it's also really necessary to, uh, if you like, acknowledge these contributions because it allows us to challenge this kind of homogenization of older people, which has happened uh, as well. And the sort of ways that we sometimes think of older people during the pandemic as being almost passive and being uh, vulnerable. And of course, there's a huge diversity of older adults, huge diversity of needs, and a huge diversity of contributions happening. But what I want to really focus on though, is uh, just a, a few considerations that have really stemmed from some of the work that we've been doing with uh, older people in different kind of place environments. And I suppose in that case, what I really want to kind of highlight is some messages around the importance of context and diversity of contribution. I want to highlight um, uh, the importance of uh, volunteering as a means of integration and inclusion, and then perhaps also say something about volunteering as, as potentially a mechanism, mechanism of exclusion. So if you like being a little bit more critical about what volunteering might mean in later life. So I'll try and be as brief as I can. If I'm going over Lorraine, you can, uh, you can wave your arms or anything like that. Um, so firstly, I suppose in terms of context and diversity, uh, a lot of the work that we would have done would have been in smaller communities, often rural communities. And I think what's really important here is that volunteering is essentially filling a, a space in many of these communities. So because of the structural conditions of these communities, it does mean that a lot of public infrastructure and indeed a lot of private infrastructure have departed of these sites or has transformed or has been, uh, if you like, retrenched a little bit, which means that there's kind of gaps in services and there's gaps in opportunities there that people typically would have within their neighborhoods. So what we would have found is that older people and other uh, different sections of these communities as well would really end up filling these gaps. And certainly in a lot of these communities, older volunteers 
and the, the kind of the civil society sector are really the primary source of social innovation. And it's an innovation that kind of spans a multitude of different spheres. So you're talking about sports, you're talking about health and social care, you're talking about economic elements, even diversification elements in the context of rural environments. And certainly a lot of people who are considered to be in their latter years would be very instrumental in that. And that's both just in terms of people contributing various different things. So whether it's uh, active retirement groups that take on a little bit more of social care activities, uh, whether it's um, sporting activities that where uh, an older person might take on a little bit more of a voluntary contribution around uh, GA selection and training, or whether it's people who actually take more of a community champion role to really try and champion the local community and its development uh, is really significant as well. On top of that, then, we would find it quite a continuum there where for some people, they would move into that role of social entrepreneurs. And we have some very prime examples across Ireland where you know, very local groups have actually grown into very, uh, very impactful national organizations. And certainly a lot of the time it's been led by people uh, in those latter years of life as well. So I suppose in that context, what we need to recognize is the diversity of those contributions and we need to recognize that there are structural conditions that, if you like, create those opportunities, but also really create that need for people uh, to contribute. I suppose the last point I would make around that is that a lot of these contributions are stealth. And what we find in the international literature is that right across different uh, spheres of life, sometimes there is, a, there is an expectation that if you fulfill a certain role in the community already, you will take on a little bit more of a role in terms of contributing. So certainly health professionals, certainly people in the sporting uh, arena, whatever it might be. So a lot of these uh, practices go uncaptured, if you like. So I think it's just something to be aware of in, in that context. The second point I really wanted to kind of make was about how volunteering can be a real potential source and a potential pathway for integration and inclusion in later life. And certainly this is, again, thinking of these smaller communities, this is something that can be particularly important for older people because it allows them to continue their role within the community and to develop that role a little bit more, but also to really understand, I suppose, how volunteering and the community contribution is a central part of their identity. So if you like, it's about that sense of purpose, that sense of, of fulfillment as well. I suppose there is another element to this, if you want to carry it forward a little bit and think that, you know, these roles are very important because they're a part of people's daily routines. They're a part of people's uh, means of bonding with their communities and connection. And for that reason, they're fundamental to actually building a sense of belonging within localities. And even in some cases, there might be fundamental to how they would perceive themselves within their own community and how they would conceive of what they would describe as a sense of hope. So if you think about where we belong, we think about what we think are kind of a really powerful sense of home, it's not usually our physical dwelling, it's about how we connect and how we uh, build our own center of attachments and memories around the community. And certainly volunteering is very important for that. And it's also very important in the context of people moving into a community. It's one of those last few kind of channels that people can identify as a way to integrate, to build connections, to really tighten those close bonds that can be of a huge support to people in later life. And I, I think for all those reasons, we have to consider that. And the other element to this is just to emphasize that sometimes this volunteering is not always public. You know, it can be informal practices, it can be uh, support practices that sometimes go unseen, but are still very important for the individual giving that support and for receiving that support as well. The last element I suppose I just wanted to highlight is that, and it's a sort of a critique that is sometimes coming out of the volunteering literature now, particularly on the aging side, is I, I suppose how volunteering itself can be an exclusionary mechanism and we need to be very cognizant of that if we want to make sure that volunteering is actually a very positive uh, platform for older people in later life and i suppose there's a couple of things one is very obviously in terms of how it can actually uh, create a lot of stress and burden on individuals particularly 
in the context of communities where there there is a real feeling that if I don't provide this help, if I don't provide this assistance, then there's going to be a massive gap here in terms of service, in terms of provision. And so for that reason, then it, it is something that we just have to need, need to be aware of in terms of the sort of burden that can um, fall on people. The second element is that sometimes there's a sense of obligation, that, that obligation is projected onto us if we're in these communities. So certainly some of my international colleagues would have conducted research that would identify how if particularly you move into these areas, there is an expectation that you should volunteer. And sometimes we have national programs like a Task Force for Active Citizenship where there is an expectation that older volunteers should be contributing and, and, and to what degree they should be contributing as well. And, and I think we just have to be very cognizant of that because it puts people under a lot of pressure. It also defines uh, what we mean by contribution and maybe not always. Again, it's that uh, formal versus informal uh, uh, line if you like uh, and we just have to remember that for some people you know volunteering in the way that we conceive it might not be uh, the way that they need to integrate with their communities and the last element is i suppose who are we excluding when we create these opportunities for volunteering and again it's just to think about you know are we inadvertently leaving people out uh, and again if you think about small rural communities well sometimes quite a lot of power does rest with different uh, organizations and different groups and it's about being cognizant of how do we try and make that as inclusive as possible so all of those three messages around your structural conditions, the diversity of volunteering, the inclusion and uh, issues around exclusion are things that we just need to bear in mind uh, to allow and to facilitate uh, volunteering as being a really powerful means of participation for older people in life, but also a, a huge sense of contribution that they get from that and a, a sense of purpose as well and uh, that certainly fulfills our societies a little bit more through the contribution that they are making. So, thanks so much. Thanks, Kieran. Brilliant. Well, our showcase was a, a whistle stop tour, if you like, between the cradle to the grave, <laughs> everything from youth, adult experiences to maybe looking at some of the, the research that's coming through on older people's experiences with communities. Um, if people are comfortable, we'll pop on our cameras, we'll do a little bit of a jazz hands. I think we need to um, celebrate um, volunteering week and really just to highlight that if um, any of these topics you want to further discuss or links or um, I suppose organizations we've mentioned, we'll pop them up on our site later this evening. Of course, check out volunteer.ie, which has an incredible lineup this week. Um, maybe tapping into some of the things even Fiona mentioned around addressing um, stress and volunteer health and well-being, which is vital. Um, so volunteer.ie for lots of wonderful National Volunteering Week um, events. Um, big round of jazz hands. Uh, love you all. Great to see you and have a fabulous volunteer week. <laughs> Woo! Maybe we need more of that Katie Perry to see us out, I think. Uh, nothing like a bit of Katie. Thanks to Korma, all our panel people. Studentvolunteer.ie presents. We're coming to you again live um, in October with um, another wonderful um, online virtual um, engaged session topics that I'm sure you will want to. Uh, talk to you.